everyone. My name is Lynn Wynn. I'm sure you, you most of you already know who I am. Um, I'm the young adult librarian at Chinatown Branch Library, and I'm here with my amazing team, Genevieve here, who's been uh, running our website uh, work development work website development workshop series for the last five weeks. And of course, now we're expanding this program to introduce interdisciplinary careers in tech to you. So I'm going to turn it over to Genevieve to to be uh, to uh, start the program, but I just want to remind everyone to please, uh, at the very end, we do have a survey for you to fill out. Uh, please do take a moment to fill that out. Okay, thank you. Um, before we start, I just wanted to mention one more thing. So for those of you who came to previous workshops and might have missed some or were asking for the, the recordings or what we covered in past workshops, I've compiled it onto this um, site so it's easy for everyone to access. Okay, so after we've gone through that, now let's start the speaker series. So um, from 405 to 445, we're going to be going through questions like panel style, kind of interview style for our three wonderful speakers today. So in order, we'll be going Eric, Janelle, and then Spencer. And then at 445, we'll pivot to um, taking, F, um, taking questions from the audience. So let's start with our first question. So for each of our speakers, can you go over what your position is and what you do? So please also give an example of a project you might be working on or past projects to your context, if possible, or if you can speak about it. So I believe Eric's first. Okay, um, so my name is Eric. I'm currently a cloud uh, engineer at Apple Pay. Um, somewhat recently joined my old position was a site reliability engineer at Apple Maps. Um, what I do is basically, um, so you guys are learning how to do web development. I basically take your code and scale it out to millions of people connected at the same time on tens or hundreds of thousands of computers. And basically I do the infrastructure for your code. Um, like past projects I worked on, well, current project I'm working on was I was on call for the new iPhone 12 launch. So there was a few issues, but nothing that was very customer impacting. So that was today. Uh, past projects I worked on would be, um, I built out pretty much almost all the data centers for Apple Maps internationally. So I used to travel a lot internationally for Apple Maps to do that. Um, that's it for me. Hey everyone, I'm Janelle Chandler and my role is I'm a partner and also a creative director at an agency called Qualified Digital. Um, so my role kind of consists of two things. One, the partner side, which is really just being responsible for the entire business. Um, so the success of it, if we're, you know, making a lot of money, if we're generating a lot of income. Um, with that said, also the negatives, if we're not making enough money, if we're, uh, you know, need to let someone go. So being a partner, it's all about kind of equally sharing the business. Uh, then as a creative director, uh, kind of what I do is just oversee and also help design any type of digital product. So whether it's a website, mobile app, billboard ad, um, just kind of seeing the, the creative through. Uh, one of the probably most interesting projects that I worked on in the past was the Sephora app. Um, the reason why it was pretty cool is at the time there was no technology to kind of recognize your face and, and, you know, similar to like the Snapchat filters where you look at it and you can put on lipstick or eyeshadow or what have you. Um, about four or five years ago, that technology didn't exist. So Sephora was the first kind of brand beauty company to launch that. So as a creative director, you get to take that technology and kind of create solutions. So how would it work in an app? How can you make it look cool? How does it function properly? Um, so just being on the creative team, that's a lot of the work that we kind of do, whether it's an iPhone app or a website or even like a, you know, a TV series. So just creatively designing things. That's it for me. Hey guys, uh, my name is Spencer. Um, I'm a project manager at Tesla. And more specifically, I'm a project manager for our energy division where I project manage uh, solar and battery installations for home builders. 
So basically what my team does is we partner with home builders across the country that want to include solar as a standard option for their homes. And I'm responsible for launching and managing a project through its completion. So the best way I would describe my, my day to day is that I'm kind of like a conductor of an orchestra where I'm giving direction to multiple teams, including designers, engineers, permitting inspections, our install crews, and I'm developing a plan and standard operating procedures that everyone needs to follow to be successful. And I make sure that we execute it for the project to be on schedule, um, within budget and you know, uh, basically running smoothly. Um, one example of a project I'm working on right now is that I'm helping an existing client update their solar sizing to meet new building code. So in California, all new homes that are under three stories need to have uh, a certain amount of solar. And what I'm doing is I'm coordinating with the builder's um, energy rater to get their energy reports for all their home, all of their homes. And I'm having my engineering team determine how many panels we need to put on each of those homes in order to meet the requirement. And then I'm, what I'm going to do is execute those sizes with our internal team to make sure that our crews and our designers know when the new sizes are in effect and which homes they need to put that on. That's it for me. Thank you. You all have such amazing careers. But did you know that you're going into this career as a teenager? Or who or what inspired you to choose this pathway? Uh, so my mom, um, I sort of knew I was going to this career as a teen. Um, I've always been really interested in computers. Um, as a kid, I, I think I started learning to type when I was like five or six. So I, I sort of knew what I was going to do. Um, yeah, I think I did. Um, who or what inspired me to choose this path? I don't think there was too much inspiration. I just generally liked computers and did a lot of reading and self-study on the side. And I just kind of found myself in here, so. Yeah, for me, um, did I know if I, you know, as a teen, if I wanted to do this? Absolutely not. Um, I think I wanted to do like, I don't know, be a veterinarian or do something other than design. Um, but what kind of led me to this path was I just interned at a lot of different places, worked at a lot of different places when I was younger. Uh, so I kind of got a feel for what I didn't like and what I did like. And there was this one company, it was a architecture firm. I had this idea that I like wanted to build houses. So I ended up interning there and kind of realized like, geez, I don't like anything about architecture. There's a lot of math involved, not my wheelhouse. But what that exposed me to is I got to get insight into the other departments, which was the creative department, the graphic design department. Um, and I really liked you know, the work that came out of there. I liked what I saw. I liked the team. Um, and I kind of wanted to be a part of it. So that's that's kind of how I got, you know, pushed into my path. Just a lot of like trial and error, trial and that I took on a lot of like, you know, small jobs, internships. I'm forever thankful that she told me about that at that pivotal moment in my life because I basically ended up taking um, night school at um, Extension and I learned sustainability on my own time and that just got me hooked and set my career on, on this path. And I would say that um, I became more altruistic the more I learned about sustainability that made me want to be like really environmental. And I, I think that like, you know, climate, the climate crisis is the most important challenge of our generation. And it's kind of what I want to focus my career on now. Yeah, this is amazing. So I guess um, some um, touched upon like exploration, especially. So the next question is, 
how how did you get to where you are in terms of like education? Um, I went to Cal Poly Pomona for computer science. Um, however, my computer science and what I do, while there's a lot of overlap, a lot of it was self-studying. So I did a lot of, you know, play on the side of the computer, you know, whatever technology and play on the side of the computers, a lot of reading. I went to a lot of conferences. So yeah, um, I think that's it for me. <laughs> yeah, for me, I mean, I kind of told you guys before, like early on, I was just doing a lot of jobs in my high school year and interning. Um, so when it came time for college, I knew I wanted to go to art school. Um, I was born and raised in Maryland and I knew I did not want to go to school there. So I was like, where are the biggest art schools? Um, you know, California has some, New York has some. So I ended up uh, going to the School of Visual Arts uh, in New York. Um, Spencer, I know you're in New York, so I think my school is actually pretty close to you, but uh, I went there and just kind of studied, uh, you know, fine art, so painting and drawing and kind of learning the foundation of just art in general. Um, definitely not really what I'm doing right now. Everything's computer focused, but what school really did teach me was the foundational elements um, and then you know, nowadays with technology and things like that, you kind of just have to always go to conferences or learn on your own hand just to keep up with the, the pace. But yeah, for the most part, I just went to um, an art school and then from there did my own learning and studying on the side. Yeah, for me, um, I went to UC Riverside and I got a bachelor um, in global studies. Um, I also got a sustainability certificate at UCR Extension, and then I got a LEED GA certification um, when I got my first job out of college. Um, right now, I'm still kind of going for my PMP certification for project management, um, which is like, it's, it's kind of like an emerging internationally recognized certification for project managers, and I hope to get that um, sometime next year. Yeah, so building on this concept of like constant like learning and constant like getting new experiences, what were some of your first jobs or internships before your like, position currently? Um, my first job was actually at the Glidden Public Library. I did basically all the tech support, setting up servers, setting up computers. And, um, you know, I, I kind of wanted to work on something bigger. So I went to, I moved to the Bay Area. And I worked at HP for half a year, and then half a year later, I went to um, um, Apple. So um, unfortunately, I didn't do any internships. That's probably one of my regrets in life. So I encourage you all to definitely pursue internships. Yeah, I would say I started doing internships in high school. Um, so you guys know the architecture was the first one, which totally sucked for me. But you know, I kind of got some good out of that. Um, other than that, in college, I did a bunch of different internships, like on the brand side. So uh, working at AOL, I can't even believe I'm saying that because it's, you know, AOL is so old and dinosauric, but, uh, you know, just taking internships wherever I could, because whether they're cool or not, you're going to learn if you like something or if you don't. Um, because just being at a company, it's so intricate in terms of the department you want to be in in your actual role. So for me, architecture firm, I worked at AOL doing an internship there. I also worked at my school computer lab, like I was IT support. So just kind of a range of different things for me to, to pick and choose and, and figure out where I wanted to take myself after I graduated college. And for myself, um, so when I came out of college, it was right after the 2008 financial crisis. So it was a really bad recession and like nobody was hiring. So I originally applied for a position at Solar City, and I completely bombed the phone interview. And so my first job out of college was actually working as like a warehouse associate for an LED company that was converting um, tropical aquarium lighting uh, to LEDs. And I was basically like, packing boxes, packing orders 60% of my time. 
And then um, I also had an internship when I was studying abroad in Shanghai, which was cold calling um, banks in Australia to complete phone <laughs> surveys um, for a research company, which is very, very hard. I think I only got like one uh, executive to talk to me. So I would say like, I definitely had humble beginnings to my career, which I think is good. I think it taught me, um, you know, when, when you have to eat humble pie in your first positions, I think it really teaches you humility and, you know, just, just how to appreciate the help that people give you as you kind of go on this uh, journey on your career. Yeah, that's a lot of like cool things that don't necessarily like pop up when you talk about your current position, but that's super interesting. So our next question is, what is your company culture like since you all three of you work at like distinctly like different companies? And then are there many like job positions within your career? Um, Apple's company culture, I mean, to start off is extremely detail oriented. And I've always been very detail oriented to start with. I think that's probably why they liked me. And over the years, I just got even more detail oriented. Um, the only thing bad is I tend to butt heads with project matters because project managers want to move this project along while I kind of want to, you know, slow it down and make sure it's done correctly. Uh, another, I think, very key aspect in Apple is probably secrecy. So I think a lot more companies are a lot more open. So like, for example, just to give this talk, I, I, I asked my manager just to cover myself. So while I think a lot of other companies wouldn't care, you know, like, um, so you rarely find Apple speakers at various conferences um but yeah and also innovation we always try to think differently we you know there's always probably a better way to do some things and we try to slow things down and make sure it's done right yeah so for me um i kind of told you guys before right now i'm a partner at an agency which means i can also create and help push through the company culture. Um, so the other partners and I, before we really started the company, we all came from different backgrounds on the agency side. And we took everything that we didn't like and we formed a company to pretty much do the opposite. So um, our, our company culture is we like to one, empower women in leadership. Um, kind of up and coming topic nowadays to diversity. We make sure we're including a whole bunch of diversity candidates and we're a well-rounded company. Um, and then I would say three, like our mindset, which is, I feel like a little different than other agencies is that we all are practitioners and experts in our craft. So usually sometimes you'll have creative directors that just talk about a vision and have their team execute. But here, everyone thinks of an idea, everyone thinks about the vision and everyone executes. So um, we're, the company culture is more like a group collaboration. It doesn't really matter what level you are, your voice is always gonna be heard. Um, so that's, that's one thing about our company and, and also being a partner to help create and facilitate and making sure the company culture is very welcoming and warm and you know, like we're not kids or babies. It's just like, here's the work, let's get it done. Let's get it done together the best way we can and, and innovate as well. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and I would say my company culture is, is very good. Um, it's, it's very demanding, like most Silicon Valley tech companies. I feel like if you're the type of person that just wants to clock in and out, do 40 hours a week and not think about work when you go home, you're, you're probably not gonna get very far or be very happy in the company. Um, but I would say that I've always had like really good support from my managers and they've always treated us like adults and they don't over micromanage us. Um, so I've always appreciated that because I've known other teams and other companies where you know they really micromanage you and it kind of gets in the way of productivity. Um, I would say that the, the positions in my career they, they kind of start from like entry level you would start as a project coordinator. Um, then you would move on to project manager and there's like different levels of project manager. I think my company has like three or four. Um, and then you would become like a program manager and then a director and then a vice president. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's a lot of interesting about like how like uh, companies like build cultures and how it's so distinct when you described it. Like for example, when I was describing Apple and then you know describing qualified digital and then Tesla. So the next question is, what are some of the biggest challenges or rewards that you have encountered throughout your career? I think the biggest challenge for um, for my role is scale. Like um, when I was at the Glenda Public Library, I supported maybe a hundred computers and like five servers. And when I went to HP, it was probably tens of thousands or twenties of thousands. And when I went to Apple, it's like we're talking hundreds of thousands of computers, and you know millions of people accessing you know these computers at the same time during lunch day all over the world. And what you learn to do from self self teaching and school, they teach you stuff generally on a small scale, and you have to think differently to make sure it works on large, basically global scale. Um, in terms of rewards, one thing that I really enjoyed was being able to travel for work um, for like the first four years of I was with MAPS, I traveled all over the world. I spent like two months in Beijing for work. Um, I, I think if I were to do life again, I think I was younger, I would try to pick out a job that allows me to do a lot of traveling and I'd probably study abroad. Yeah, for me, some of the biggest challenges I would say are probably not really work related, but more so personal. So like um, just even in the beginning, actually even now in my, my career, like the challenge for me is imposter syndrome, um, especially when I go into meetings and there's like 50 executives. I'm like, wait, what am I doing here? Like, I can't do this. Um, over time, you kind of end up learning how to get that out of your head. But for me, it's like imposter syndrome. Am I good enough? Can I do the job? Like I obviously can, but you still have that kind of voice in the back of your head all the time. Um, and I've experienced that throughout my entire career. Uh, it, it gets easier because you learn how to mute it, but still some of the bigger challenges. Um, then in terms of reward, I would say like traveling, I would say um, for me right now, I would say growing out a team. So designing the structure of the team and the people I place on the team and seeing them excel, um, those are some of the greatest rewards. Uh, also, like doing mentorship programs and, you know, like speaking to you guys, like that's a big reward to me because it's like, this is the new generation coming up and out. Like, it's exciting to see that. It's refreshing to see that. Um, so for me, it, it's not so much challenges or rewards like specifically in my career but everything that's kind of outside of it and the people who I meet and contribute and, and things like that. And for myself I would say um, that the biggest challenge at the start was trying to get a job in a recession so I think um, I wish I had focused more in college and had done more internships because when times are tough you, you really need something to set yourself apart from other people um, but, you know, whatever you don't have in terms of work or internships, you can try to make up in education. So I was really glad that I did night school at Extension and got my sustainability certificate, um, even though it made my schedule way crazier. And I would say, like, throughout my career, one of the biggest challenges is that I'm not as tech savvy as I wish I was. Um, and I wish I was better at things like SQL and just mastering, like, the Microsoft Office suite where you know, I can just really command the software to make reports and, and just make my, my work a lot easier. I kind of wish I had more technical background in that. Um, but I really think that like, yeah, like you can, you can learn anything on Google. So with the internet and the resources that you guys have, like sky's the limit for you guys and you guys can really accomplish anything you set your mind to. Our next question is, so if you could turn back time, what is something you would tell like your younger self, like maybe like when you're in college or like as a teenager, or, like even a child? Um, for me, I, one of my biggest regrets was probably not doing internships and B, 
for me, at least personally, because my industry is in the Bay Area, not moving to the Bay Area earlier and, um, you know, getting, getting my foot in the door in a major tech company when I was younger. Um, my first big job, my first job at a big tech company was like 29 at HP. Um, and many times when I'm interviewing interns or talking to interns, they're getting their foot in the door at early 20s. And that was one of my biggest um, regret. Um, another thing is once you have a job and you make good money, you should learn to manage that money. And I kind of wish I listened to my mom about investing, not just saving, just learning how to invest. And um, now that I'm in my 30s, that's becoming very, very important to me. So I wish I told myself when I was 20 to manage my money better. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, for me, I, I would say I could probably, I mean, there's a lot of things, but I'll boil it down to maybe like two. The first one I would say is explore, like explore every kind of path that you can think of that you're interested in. Um, don't focus too much on one thing, like explore every kind of option. You have your whole life to focus on one single career. Come up with hobbies, find different hobbies, just explore everything. Um, just because when you get older, that kind of stuff is going to get a lot harder. Uh, you're going to have more responsibilities. You're going to have less time to do things. Um, you're going <laughs> to spend a lot of time trying to figure out what you like. So now is the time to explore every type of opportunity you can. Um, like you hear all of us talking internships, do like three, four, five, six, like, you know, like go for it. Like if you're into video game design, do try two internships at different companies, like explore as much as you can. And then I would say probably the second thing for me is, and I know it's COVID, so it's kind of weird, but travel, like explore different cultures, get outside of the US if you can and see how people are living outside of this little world bubble that we have in the US. Like whether, you know, you travel to some rural place or some fancy place, see how people are living differently, see what their interests are. Um, like I said before, it's only gonna get a little more challenging. You're gonna have less time when you're older do all that stuff now. You're, you have your whole life ahead of you. Just explore and travel and figure out, you know, how other people are living and living their life. And uh, for me, I would say firstly, um, you know, follow your heart and really spend the time to find out what you're passionate about and then find a career or a company that can foster that passion. Um, and then I would also say, like, don't worry too much, you know, like, 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 like the, the other presenters are saying, when you're younger and you're first starting your career, you can explore a lot of different positions and find out what you're good at. So, you know, I'll, I'll tell you guys what my, 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 my favorite boss ever told me. And he said to me, you know, follow your heart, don't follow the money. And if you follow your heart and you work really hard, I promise you, the money will come later. And I think like my career is a perfect example of that because when I first started um, at Solar City and then Tesla, you know, we had so many roadblocks along the way. It was, it was definitely a bumpy road to seeing the stock price to what it is now. And, you know, so many of my colleagues left and even my own mom was like, you know, you should really leave Tesla and try a different company. But, you know, me sticking with it because I knew it's really what I wanted to devote my career to you know, the, the advancement of sustainability and the conversion of sustainable energy is just what I'm passionate about. And it's led me to live in like, you know, different places. I've lived in Las Vegas. I've lived in San Diego, Los Angeles. I just moved to New York. And so all of that was because I followed my passion and I was sensible enough to, you know, to, to hone my skills and work hard at my craft and really master it. And I, I think if you guys do the same, you know, you can be happy and make a lot of money and not have to, you know, be in a career that you, that you hate or you don't like, like some people do. Yeah, thank you all for that great advice. I hope like people come like take away from that, this workshop, like that advice to like grow and then also be passionate and not just like follow the money. Yeah, so our next question is, is there anything you haven't already mentioned that you would like to share 
with the audience about your job specifically or also anything else about like career pathway or advice? Um, I think my last set of advice is self-studying. Um, I, I wouldn't be here where I am right now without self-studying. And I think, um, try, I won't say try to cram, but try to do it when you're young. Um, because like uh, someone mentioned, um, is it, once you get harder, you just don't have that much time. It's being harder and harder to do that. So um, make sure you use your teens and 20s wisely. I wish I did. <laughs> Yeah, I, I will probably piggyback off of a little bit of what Spencer said earlier, like following your passion. I would also say, don't be so hard on yourself. Uh, when I was your age, I used to plan out like literally everything, like go to college, get this degree, have this career, do this. Your life is not going to map out exactly how you plan it and don't hate yourself or be mad at yourself for that. Like when I was your age, I was probably like thinking by the time I'm 30, I should be retired with like millions of dollars in my bank account if I work super hard. It's never going to be exactly how you plan it out. So don't have, you know, don't be too hard on yourself. Just go with the ups and downs of life. Your, your life, your career, your job, it's going to, if you follow your passion, it's going to take you in the right path. It's not going to be the path that you thought of when you were younger. Like, I think I wanted to be like an astronaut. Like, I'm totally not that right now. But it's, you know, just go with the ups and downs and follow your passion so that you can really experience and enjoy life to the fullest. Yeah, I would echo that too. And I would say, um, um, don't worry too much about comparing yourself to your friends and your peers. You know, I, th I think a lot of times we get trapped into chasing money when we see our friends, you know, like everyone has Instagram and everyone's trying to keep up with each other. You know, it's, it's this continuous pursuit of like trying to obtain, you know, money and status that ultimately will, will make you very unhappy. So I think, you know, the, the more time you spend getting to know yourself, to getting to know what your strengths are, what your weaknesses are, and you know, really following your passion, you could try to escape the trap of always comparing yourself to your friends and how other people are doing and just being at peace with yourself. Yeah. Once again, I think that's incredible advice. I know that I can relate as a high schooler where I've fallen into the trap of like either trying to plan too far or too or not plan well enough or that aspect of comparison with other peers. So Thank you for that advice. So now we, we've moved on to our Q&A portion. So as Ms. Lynn mentioned, please type any questions you have in the chat and I'll go through them with our speakers. So while I give everyone some time to think of more questions, there was a question that was pre-submitted that is, how do you manage your time? What do you do when you feel overwhelmed with work or like? <laughs> um. I don't know, I, I work strangely. I, I procrastinate when there's not a lot of pressure. And so I actually work really well under pressure. Um, if anything, I tell my manager, just give me more work, I'll actually get it done. If you don't give me enough work, I just kind of slack off. So I'm not the right person to ask that question. So um, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the complete opposite. So like what I told you guys before, I'm a planner. Like I have maybe like four to-do lists, like all organized, color-coded, sectioned out. Um, so that's kind of how I usually plan out certain things. Every Friday, I have a planning session for next week. Like I plan months in advance, things like that. So that's how I kind of manage my time. Um, it does get exhausting. So I like to sometimes just completely ignore it, which gives me a sense of like, oh, you know, you're, you're like a rebel, or you're not following your to-do list. Um, and then also, I think one of your other questions was like, uh, I guess, repeat the last part of your question, Genevieve, I'm sorry. Um, it was, what do you do when you feel overwhelmed? Great, great question. So what I usually do is, especially if I'm overwhelmed on a project, um, when it comes to creativity, you tend to need to have a clear mind 
a clear space. So when I get overwhelmed, I'll probably go take a walk play with my dog, close my laptop, get away, remove myself from the situation and not think about it for a period of time and then come back and see it with a different light or a different perspective. Um, or sometimes, you know, just talking to a friend so that it kind of takes your stress level down. So you're not so overwhelmed and then you can just jump back in and be like, oh, okay, here's what I need to do. I, I can think a little more clearly now than being super frustrated or overwhelmed or what have you. Yeah, for myself, um, you know, like, like time management is very important in project management. So I think keeping a, a calendar is very important to me. So at the end of each day on my work calendar, I'll always block out time for whatever tasks I need to do the next day. And then I also try to block like, you know, like you want a calendar that has your work, but you also want a calendar that can track the fun stuff you do too. So I always block out time to have fun and I block out time to work and I try to stick to those schedules. And if I have to move stuff around, I'll move it around. But I've, I've found that using software really helps me. And there's a lot of like free software that you can get that, you know, just, just the basics like Google Calendar or, you know, Outlook and uh, Microsoft OneNote have you know really changed my life into being more organized and i think you know definitely setting time to have fun is is very important for when you're feeling overwhelmed and yeah i, I would say i would do the same thing like if i'm feeling overwhelmed i think it's always good to take a break step away from it um get some new insight and then you know attack it fresh the next day so our next question from the audience member is how fast did you get a job after graduation? Um, I was different. I started working at the library. I was like 17. So I've always actually, I've, I've never stopped working. So I, that was, in some ways I was kind of regret. I should have taken some time off, explore, you know, like spent two weeks in Europe by myself. So, um, but yeah, after I graduated, I was already working already full time, so. Um, I think that's kind of unusual. I don't think most people do that. Um, that's it for me. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat with Eric. Like I told you guys, I did a few internships. Um, my first job out of school was AOL. I interned my last senior year at AOL. And then once I graduated, I think I waited maybe like a week and then I started like a full-time job at AOL. Um, that's one thing I kind of regret. I wish I'd taken more time to just travel and, and kind of, you know, you just graduated college, you, you need a break, you have your whole life to work. So, um, but yeah, I mean, my transition was like literally internship. Oh, one week break, full-time job. Um, so yeah, I got it pretty immediate after college. I was a little bit different because um, I didn't have anything lined up after college. So uh, I did get offered an unpaid internship for City of Santa Monica because they were starting a sustainability um, office, but I couldn't afford to put myself up and my parents couldn't afford to support me either. So I couldn't take that one. And I had to actually move back home with my parents like a lot of kids did back in those days. And then I think it took me maybe one or two months to get that warehouse job. Yeah. And then after I was in that warehouse job for six months, I thought to myself, you know what, I really still want to go back and try to apply for Solar City. And that's what I did. I, I quit my job at the warehouse. And within two months, I actually got a better position at Solar City than the one that I had bombed previously. So that all worked out for me. Yeah, I think that just goes to show like how many different like, pathways there are. So next question is, are there opportunities for teens or college students in your companies? I, like maybe like internships or like programs? Um, I don't know if there's any opportunities for teens. However, there are tons of internships. Um, I know the, there's, at least in Silicon Valley, there, there are a lot of internships out there and um, a lot of them pay very well. Um, so I, when you, when you I highly encourage all of you guys to um, try to get an internship, so. 
that's it. Yeah, I would say the same thing, specifically for my company, um, because we are still on the smaller side, I wouldn't say there's a ton of opportunities, uh, but there are several in the form of internships, whether it's on the creative design side, engineering, product management, or even just like shadowing the business as a whole. Definitely. Um, a lot of times we may not post these things. So uh, I would encourage everyone if you're interested in a job, not just or an internship, not just with my company, but any kind of company, feel free to message someone. You'd be surprised on how many people are actually looking for that, but they're just not vocal about it or posting that kind of stuff. Um, and that's kind of like my company. We don't really post any internships like that, but we actually, I, I wanna say maybe about five months ago, we had this one student who was like, I'm really interested about learning the business side. And we're like, of course, like we, come on, we will pay you. Like you, you can work maybe five, 10 hours a week and just watch what we do, help contribute if you like and, and get what you need from that. Um, and a lot of people, especially in California, like Silicon Valley, the tech companies, they're all for that. So I would say, if you don't see a posting, just reach out and, and connect with someone. Um, and then, yeah, Tesla does have um, student internships. And I think that all of them are actually paid. Uh, I'll put a link in the chat for you guys. Um, I'm afraid I don't know very much more than that because I've never worked with interns. So I don't exactly know what kind of positions are available, but you guys can check out that website and there's a lot of FAQs and I think a list of, or there's a link to apply. So you apply online. Yeah, that's super cool. So the next question from the audience member is, how do you manage to self-study or obtain the opportunities they got in order to develop their skills for their jobs? So I think maybe another wording is like, um, find the resources to self-study or also, I think Jonelle touched upon this, like getting internships by reaching out. So maybe if you could elaborate on like other ways or whatnot, there's with self-study as well. Um, at least for me, um, the first way is to get, get a book and read it. Um, like, let's just say you wanted to learn more about development or software engineering. And you will likely probably pick up a book on Python, Ruby, Go, or Java and, um, and read it. And the second part of it is um, just trying the technology out. And it's really easy when you have a computer. Um, you know, like, let's just say you want to be in a mechanic. You could take auto shop at, you know, your local community college. But taking auto shop and reading in a book is different from getting your hands dirty and learning how to do your brakes and change your oil. So the second aspect of it is you should try to get your hands dirty. Yeah, I would say um, for self-study, like there's a lot of programs out there, paid and also for free. Um, like General Assembly, for example, they have literally maybe like 20 free workshops a week. Um, so pick your topic, learn about it. You're learning from real life experts. There's a lot of programs in that capacity. Um, I would also say right now, there is also mentorship programs that are for free, um, like built by girls, Genevieve, and also in the design community, there's ADP lists. Connect with mentors to help guide you um, so that you can do those self-learning things. You can work on a project with them. Um, you can gain knowledge from them, they can gain knowledge from you. Um, and that's, those are some ways that I also do self-studying still now, is just joining programs, connecting with like-minded individuals, and then going home and like YouTubing things or trying things out, like, you know, practice makes perfect, especially for design. Practice those things on your own time. You don't know the answer, Google does. Like you could Google it and ask your friends, ask your mentorship or attend a program if it's something that's more complicated. Um, but there's, yeah, there's a lot of self-learning videos, tutorials um, and websites that can help you bridge that gap if you need it. Yeah, I would definitely echo everything they just said, um, especially like using Google and YouTube. Um, I think continuing education is, is very important into 
you know, kind of learning like more specifically like the, the kind of position that you want. So something that I did is that I, I tried to talk to people that were in my industry and I would ask them about certifications that I had heard about. So I asked my boss like, hey, have you heard about this project manager certification? What do you think about it? You know, if you were hiring somebody, would it matter to you that they had this? And when he said yes, that's, that's how I knew I should pursue it. So I think really, you know, learning what other types of educations are out there for what you wanna do is very important. And then checking with somebody actually in the industry, if, it's, if it holds value, in, in, you know, in the real world will give you a good idea of what to do next after you complete college. So just before we move on to the next question, I will, do want to do a quick plug for the mentorship program that Jonelle just mentioned. It's called Wave by Built by Girls, and it's a mentorship program for females who want to be more interested in the technology industry, whether it's creative um, and engineering specific or business. And if you're a female or non-binary individual age 15 to 22, you can sign up for this mentorship program and get matched to a, mem a mentor in industry. Yeah, so just, it's a really great program. So I really highly recommend doing it if you want to gain more knowledge from people who do work in industry. So next question. So th this is a question for Spencer specifically. Um, you mentioned that you studied abroad and they have a question about um, where did you study and how did you do it? And if English wasn't the popular language, did you need to thoroughly learn the country's language and culture beforehand? Oh, these are great questions. Um, so yeah, my study abroad was in Shanghai, in China. And it was, yeah, the, the either my junior or my senior year, but um, I actually didn't have the grades enough to go with the UC program because you needed a higher GPA. So I found a loophole where I found a private company that did programs and then the UC actually approved it so that my credits would count when I took the classes in China. Um, I'm Chinese, but I don't speak Chinese. So it was very hard for me to go over there and, and just be you know, immersed in, into the language. But I would say that you know, English is very commonly spoken throughout the world. So you're always gonna find someone that speaks English. So when you go abroad, the first thing you should do is find a language partner. So you find somebody that wants to improve their English and in and basically you'll just hang out with them, you know, go to coffee shops, go around, you know, go around the city, and he'll, he'll, you know, the other person will be able to practice their English, and you'll be able to practice your your Chinese or whatever you're trying to learn. Um, but yeah, overall it was like like one of the best experiences of my life. Um, I encourage everyone if you can to do it before you start getting into your like main career because I think when life kind of takes over, you might not have time for it. But when you're young and fresh, like where you guys are now, it's sometimes it could be the perfect time, COVID notwithstanding. Cool. And this is an interesting question about um, as you are like professionals in your industries now and you're like adults, what do you quant like what do you describe as success being? Or even if you're not sure, even if like as you're getting older, you, it changes every time. So what do you think like um, compares like the, what you thought success was when you were younger with success now? <laughs> I think when I was younger, um, you know, I success to me was having a stable job and making good money. But as I get older, um, success to me is what kind of impact I can make um, towards the world. And that's one thing I like to work at Apple because whatever you work on, it's global scale. Um, and like, for example, what's really cool was um, during COVID, a lot of people started using Apple Pay just so you have contactless payment. So it's really cool to see your work actually making other people's lives better. Yeah, I would say younger wise like success to me meant like money 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 like make sure I have a stacked bank account things like that but as I'm older it's more about and and once you once you're in this for a while and you're working for a long time it's like does your creativity help anyone does it make something better that's not just for yourself um 
I would also kind of say too, like having the ability to just spend time with family and friends as cheesy as that sounds. Um, like right now you guys are probably in high school or, or younger. So you have a big pool of friends. You're meeting a lot of new people. As you get older, that kind of stops and slows down a bit. So just having the ability to spend time and not have to worry to me is success. And also like getting my work seen by a lot of different people, millions of people, that's an awesome feeling. So it, that type of exposure is success to me. Yeah, I would echo the same thing that when I was young, success to me meant money. Um, not necessarily money for myself to do like, I, you know, how, like how many of us would love to have enough money to like buy our parents and our, and our brothers and our sisters houses and stuff like that. But I think as I got older, success is more alt altruistic to me, meaning that I really, you know, I want to leave this world better than when I came into it. And I think that you can find a very good balance in your career to do those things and also make a good living and be comfortable. Um, and yeah, I, I just think that a lot of it had to do because my parents rubbed off on me that, that you know, they, they were never big into money too. And they were always big into helping people. So I think just, you know, doing stuff that makes, makes you at peace is really what kind of defines success to me. And if it can be altruistic and positive for other people, even better. So there's another question and we probably should have asked this one before the previous question, but if anyone feels comfortable sharing about um, what's around an approximate like starting salary for your position in industry, like it doesn't have to be your specific company, but just like an approximate amount, I guess. Um, that's some, a little difficult to answer. The reason is most of the times we talk about total compensation. Uh, the reason is your base salary, which probably say it's like a hundred thousand dollars. They'll probably throw an extra hundred thousand dollars in stock on top of it. So I think a good starting point for my field is probably a hundred thousand dollars for the total compensation of 150 to 200. So, um, yeah. Um, Another advice that I would also encourage you, which I did not understand when joining Apple was, don't focus just on the salary, focus on the total compensation. And that includes bonus, stock plans, 401k, you know, whatever the match is too. Yeah, so for me, it's a, it's a little different because I'm kind of in two roles, a partner and a creative director. So it's always going to depend on the size of the company. Um, like, you know, if I was a partner and creative director at a huge company, I'd probably, your starting place would be a lot more. Um, for those two roles, I would say you'd probably start off around, like your base would be around 200K. Um, and then on top of like a yearly bonus, also when you're a partner, let's say the company makes a ton of profit for that year now you're also going to get a percentage of that profit um, just for yourself. So it, it kind of depends, but generally right now, especially in creative and tech, it's a demand for creative directors who know tech, who know innovation. So, I mean, by the time you guys are getting ready for these jobs or getting out in your career, it's probably going to be like maybe even double um, that kind of base. But generally right now, I would say base salary starts around 200K. Yeah, then my field is, um, I think it's a lot humbler. <laughs> so I think when I first, yeah, the like when you first come in as a uh, project coordinator, you're looking at a little bit above entry level. So maybe like 40 to 45K. And then as you ascend to being a PM, you're, you're working your way to six figures, but you might be in the middle for, for a little while. But like Eric was saying, total compensation is kind of what my company was going for. So, you know, a lot, a lot of people give Elon, um, you know, a lot of flack because um, he, he, he's known to like be very cutthroat about paying, paying salaries. And it's just like, I feel like that's how all companies are. They have to be, you know, frugal when they can be, but the amount that I've made in stock has, you know, far outweighed that. So 
yeah, like total compensation, I just feel very like happy with, with what I've gotten so far. So it is almost five, but we're gonna ask one more um, main question and then we'll, we'll add a second question that's uh, pretty quick. So first, the first, second to last question for this session is this session being named like interdisciplinary careers in technology, how do you fulfill, I mean, how do you feel as someone who's been working in industry about the value of having an interdisciplinary skill set, or that's being like having, like either having like a main concentration in something, but understanding the skill sets of others, for example, like design, technological, like engineering, coding, and also understanding the business aspect of it, even though it may not be your concentration at the position. I think it's actually really important, at least at Apple, um, being detailed oriented is, um, is a trait that's valued. And um, I could kind of tell how detail oriented somebody is by just looking at what they do in their hobbies. Like some people are super meticulous on their car. Some people are super meticulous on furniture. And I think having all these different hobbies and understanding helps you um, be better at what you do. So yeah, I think that's really important. Yeah, I would echo the same thing. It's, it's, I would say first though, it's not mandatory, but if you wanna set yourself apart, if you want to push your career trajectory, then that is something that you definitely wanna include. Um, the expectation would be if you came on as a designer for my company that you would just design. But if you know other things, if you know, and you don't have to know everything in depth, but if you know about coding, you don't know, you don't need to know how to code. You're able to speak code. You're able to communicate with developers. If you know some sort of the business, if you know some sort of project management, one, that's going to get you hired like way faster than anyone else. Two, um, you want to talk salary, like that's going to up your salary just a little bit more because yes, you can do your core focus, but now we can use you for a few different other things as well. So it, you just become a very valuable and rare asset. So one, not mandatory, but two, if you're really trying to like spike your career trajectory, get that moolah and like learn a bunch of stuff, like it's definitely an important factor. Yeah, definitely. I would agree that um, it's very important when you want to advance your career um, because it'll set you apart and, you know, any, any kind of edge, any ace up your sleeve is going to help you when you're trying to go for a position that other people are going for too. But I'll also say that it protects you from layoffs. And so, you know, every company has, has, you know, periods in their, in their, in their time where they're going to have layoffs. And if you are inter inter interdisciplinary and you have uh, an extra skill over your counterparts, they're going to keep you first, you know, and, and that's kind of what happened to me is that I got really good at understanding like architecture and construction. So I could talk shop with the other builders and the foreman and, you know, the boots on the ground. So that kind of made me indispensable where we had a period of like, I don't know, it was like four or five sets of layoffs and I, I survived them all, you know? And, I, and it was because I had that interdisciplinary background. So actually one more question, is there some, some quick advice that you can give to high schoolers, for example, who are looking for either an internship or work? Um. I didn't do an internship, so I can't comment on it, but I've always, I have a friend, her name's Claire. Um, I know she went to UCSD. She, she I think during her UCSD um, days, she interned at Intel, then she went interned at Apple, then she was converted to full-time, and now she's at Palo Alto Networks. And I really wish I did that. Um, that's all I have to offer. <laughs> yeah, I would say, um, like, I think the question is looking into getting an internship, maybe. I would say 
what are your hobbies? Start there, list out everything that you think is pretty awesome. And then look for the jobs, the companies who do that. Um, then search if they have an internship program. If they don't, go on LinkedIn and reach out to a recruiter or a designer, or you know, if it's engineering, a developer, um, and just say, hey, like, you know, I like the work you guys are doing. Um, can I be a part of your team in an internship capacity? Um, and then I would say, if you're, if you do get an internship, network, learn as much as you can about the business. Um, once you do this for a while, you're going to learn that the corporate world, the tech world is very, very small. It's going to be about who you know to get those connections, to get further in advance. Um, but I would say starting out like, yeah, LinkedIn, just kind of listing all the things you like to do and, and go seek out those companies that actually do it. I think my advice would be um, to be persistent and be okay with rejection. Because I think when you're first starting out and you're in this boat of thousands of other applicants, you're gonna get a lot of rejection and you need to you know, learn how to be okay with that. And I have a prime example because, you know, like I told you guys, my first job that I applied for, I bombed the interview and I really wanted it. So it was really discouraging. But what I did is, you know, I took that other job at the LED company and I, I honed my skills into, you know, doing a good job at that company and also still learning on the side as much as I could about Solar City and solar to the point where when I came back for that second interview, I, you know, I aced it and I got a better position than the original one that I missed. So as you wrap this up, there's one last inquiry about what, would we be able to connect with you if we have questions later on? And then how can we connect with you either through LinkedIn or email? And that's based off the comfort level of the speaker, of course. Um, for me, you could use my email or LinkedIn. Um, yeah, I could share my LinkedIn in, my, in the chat. Yeah, for me, um... Like LinkedIn is great. Uh, also, I think my email is on my LinkedIn, so that's fine too. But everyone on here, feel free to connect, contact me. Um, I'm here to help. So, yeah, use that. Yeah, and for me, um, yeah, probably LinkedIn is the best. So I'll send my um, my information in the chat. So it is 504. So I just wanted to say. A big thanks to our three speakers who came here today to talk to all the teams for the LAPL. And I know that especially as a as a senior in high school myself, I learned so, so much and like nothing I ever knew before, honestly. So thank you so much for uh, bringing more exposure to like, the tech industry to our local um, high schoolers and teens and maybe some middle schoolers in the greater Los Angeles area. So. Thank you so much. And especially for um, the people who have joined in right now, um, we'll, Ms. Lynn just sent, I mean, believe that Ms. Lynn has previously sent out a feedback form. And this is really important just to um, let us know like what you all would like to see. And then also say, say a written thank you to our speakers. And then lastly, as another reminder for people who are asking about past the past workshops and the curriculum we covered in those, this is, a page that has the links to all that information. So make sure to say thank you to our speakers and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you thank so everybody. much. Thank Thanks you. everyone for thank joining. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Thank you for being here today. I'll stick around for the next two minutes in case anybody has questions, but Janelle, Eric, Spencer, thank you so much for your time today. and. Uh, yeah, we look forward to see. Look at all this chat box is going crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. Wonderful. Yeah, so we'll let you guys go. We'll, we'll keep you in contact by email. And um, yeah, again, this uh, if anybody wants to go to the next career day next week on Wednesday, it's going to be featuring careers in retail. I have friends from Prada and Nike coming to speak to you about their job.